What I want to talk to you about today is something that um, the Lord started showing me some weeks back. And um, <clears throat> I, I only preach what God shows me. I don't, I don't preach stuff he doesn't show me. I, I'm, I'm, I preach what I live out in my life. And so I, 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 can, I feel like it's something that I own so I can show it to you correctly. And so um, I'm one of those guys, man, I, I am not into fads or sayings or anything like that. I just, I'm just not, man. I, I, I've never been into uh, doctrinal positions. I've always, my doctrine has always been the scriptures. I don't, I don't get into uh, fad things or something somebody said. And I'm, I, I remember when people, I remember when people came out with the j prayer. Anybody remember that? And they started talking about the Jabez prayer. And, and um, I, I never jumped into that, jumped into that pool. Uh, the thing that Jabez was trying to do was he, he was asking God to extend his tent pegs so that God would be glorified, not him. So Jabez's prayer was not for him. Jabez's prayer was for to glorify the God that he loved and he worshiped. It was a whole different idea. And so we have a tendency sometimes to jump into these terms and these ideas and stuff, and they don't really pan out because you can't use it across the totality of Scripture. Everybody say that, totality of Scripture. That means that what you see here is true all the way across the landscape of Scripture. And you can be confident in it because it's not something that's a flash in the pan. And so when you, when you have a mind that thinks like that, you look and see, is that true all the way across the scriptures? Is it true about God's character all the way across the scriptures? So today, I want to talk to you from the topic of dimensions of learning. Dimensions of learning. Now, I'm going to do this uh, biblically. And I want to start by looking at Ephesians 3. 13 through 19. Ephesians 3, 13 through 19. And it says this, Therefore I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. For this reason I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Everybody say inner man. Mm -hmm. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Can God's people say amen? Amen. Well, let's break that down because that's a big piece of meat. The Israelites have many names for God. We know and use a lot of them. Names like Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, and El Kabor. Does anybody in here know what El Kabor means? Anybody? El Kabor means the God of war. The Israelite called him El Kabor. He was the God of war. Okay, that's a name you don't hear too much, but that's a powerful name that they use for him. Are some of the most common names used to describe him. But how did he get those names? What drove them to label him with these titles? I would like to present to you a concept with, a two, with, a, with two scriptures that give us a glimpse into knowing God's love through what I call dimensions of learning. The verse we just read talks about geometric concepts, height, width, depth, and length. These all speak to dimensions. Let's look at a definition of the word dimension. This is what dimension means. The length, width, height, or depth of something a measure in one direction. The amount or number of things that something affects 
or influences. The range of which the degree, the degree to which something extends, and we call that the scope. What is the scope of what you're looking at? What does it cover? What does it influence? And how long is it? How, how deep is it? You've heard about investigations. They might say, what is the scope of your investigation? They're asking, what is the dimension that you're going to be looking? How long are you going to be doing it? How deep are you going to go? How, how, many, how many places are you going to extend your influence? So when someone says, I want to look at the scope of something, they'll talk about what is the dimension of what you're doing? Okay, what is the dimension of what you're doing? So we see that Paul is speaking of the scope in which God's love extends. The unmeasurable range of death, width, length, and height of his sovereignty. How deep does God go? How far does he reach? How big is he? What is his scope of operation? If the scope extends to his love that we are rooted in, then how do we know something so deep and so unimaginable? How, if God is rooting, he's so big and he's so wild, and the, and the scope of who he is is just so huge. Consider this verse of scripture right here. This is what uh, Paul said. Paul says, we speak wisdom not of this world, but we speak a mystery. And then he says that no mind, no ear, and no eye. Everybody remember that? No eye has seen, and no ear has heard, and no mind has conceived or understood what the Lord has prepared, but he revealed it by his spirit. Check this out. That's a dimension. Mind, ear, and eye. What is he saying? The dimension that we work on, God has not revealed it. Nobody's mind has thought about it, nobody's eye has seen it, and nobody's ear has heard it. Nobody's. He said, but I have revealed it by my spirit. Well, if that's the case, how do we understand God without understanding him primarily through this, this, and this? How do we understand him when he's not communicating to us his 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 depths and his love for us through these things. That's interesting because me and Pastor Abba was talking that the, the Gnostics believed that Jesus did not really come in the flesh. They believed that he was a spirit and that he didn't really die on the cross. It's crazy. Well, how was all the prophecies fulfilled? They were fulfilled in the natural by the Son of God, fully man, fully God. How can he be a sacrifice if he wasn't in the flesh? Everything we've always been taught about God forgiving through a sacrifice was sacrificing an animal and shedding his blood. So we already know that there are pictures in type that shows us that God works in the flesh. So if he's not, how can he reveal himself in the natural by not using the natural? If he's not revealing it through eye, ear, and, 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 uh, and mind, how does he do, how does he do it? It's, he's, so, he's so unimaginable. I mean, it's like his way, he says in Isaiah, my ways are not your ways, neither my thoughts are your thoughts. So, man, we got an issue. How does God reveal to us his great love that we are supposed to be rooted in? I'm supposed to be rooted in his love. In other words, I'm supposed to be so connected to him through his love that everything that happens in my life needs to reflect what I'm connected to. How many of y'all know uh, lemons don't grow on apple trees? Anybody ever pulled a lemon off of an apple tree? If you did, it wasn't an apple tree. Okay. You thought it was an apple tree, but it was a lemon tree because you will know it by its what? Fruit. So if we are rooted in him, then what is of him will be coming out of us. But how can I be rooted in something I don't know? How, does it, how is it revealed to me? 
Well, we know it through learning. We learn. That's how we know everything in life. We learn it. Right? I learned a lot of stuff from my mom. How many of y'all learn stuff from your mom? This is what I learned from my mom. Don't go to sleep while I'm talking to you. Anybody ever learned that from their mom? Let me tell you how I learned it. One, my mom told us that we had to clean the house up because she worked two jobs. So we, you know, we kids, let me tell y'all something. Kids don't know how to clean the house. Parents, don't get mad. They don't know how to clean. Cleaning comes with experience and know-how. And after you've learned it, let, let me tell you how I learned how to clean. I learned how to clean in one night. This is how I learned. My mama came home from work. And my mom used to do the Gestapo walk. Didn't y'all have a mom that did the Gestapo walk? I had the Gestapo walk, mom. In other words, if something wasn't done right, mom would wake us up and call all us downstairs. And, and we line up and she'd do the Gestapo walk. And she'd be looking at us. And we'd be like, standing up there half asleep. And she comes, she says, what is wrong with you kids? Look at this place. I told y'all to clean up the house. You only had one thing to do. You had to clean up the house. Look at this house. Look at this house. Look at this kitchen. And we're looking at the kitchen, and we're going like, it looked pretty good to me. And she, took, she takes a broom out and goes to one corner and starts sweeping the floor. And I could swear somebody came in there and threw dirt in the house. I do not know how she came up with that pile of dirt in the middle of the floor. I'm like looking at that going like, I know she put that there. She just want to mess with us. There's no way in the world she, she got that kind of dirt out. My mama knew how to clean. And she thought we knew how to do it. But she never really taught us. So one night, she was doing the Gestapo thing, and I was really tired. I had, I had been to school all day, football, practice, I was tired. So she was standing up there, and I was falling asleep, standing up. Y'all know how we do it. Let me take my glasses off so y'all can see me. She was talking. And she stopped in front of me. She said, Tyrone, because that's my name, because y'all didn't know that what the T stood for. My mama didn't do the nicknames. His name is Tyrone. No, no TC stuff. I said, okay, mom. She said, Tyrone, if you fall asleep on me again, I'm going to smack the spit out your mouth. I was like, <laughs> pinching myself trying to stay. I was standing up in front of her, and I was so tired, man. And as I was doing everything I could to stay up, but my eyes closed. Now, how many of y'all know that when you are asleep, your brain tells you, hey, you are asleep. You ever been driving on the road and, you are, and then all of a sudden you go, hey, man, I'm asleep. Anybody ever did that? I did that before. And when you wake up, it's like, <laughs> you are out of control because you realize you are asleep and you're trying to gain control back and it's like a crazy thing. So when I close my eyes... My brain said, hey, you better open your eyes up fast. And I opened my eyes up and mom was already swinging. <laughs> she was already swinging. And look, in my house, you had to learn how to take a, take a smack. Don't put your hand up because that means you trying to fight. I don't know if y'all know what I'm talking about. This is old school I'm talking about right now. Some of y'all been raised, y'all ain't been raised by old school. And this is an old school black mama. Okay, black mama. Y'all don't know about that, read about it. <laughs> so I saw it coming, man. And you know how the wind changes. It's like, oh, man. I, I just opened up my eyes and just. <laughs> man, I tell you what, it took me an hour to go to sleep after she smacked me. That, I learned how to clean the house from that smack because I never wanted to get that smack again. It was a pain that caused me to pay attention to how mama wanted the house clean. I was just giving it a pass. But that woman worked two jobs. She got home at midnight 
And she wanted her children to make sure that the house was clean. We had to understand that that task was important to her. It was so important to her that she was willing to make sure we understood how important it was. Could that be how the Lord allows us to know him? Now, this may shake your theology, but if you watch it and look at it across the board, you will see that it's true. We know it through learning. How do we learn it? The same way the Israelites did, through trials, sufferings, triumphs, and intimacy. See, the Israelites didn't call him El Kabor because they never was in a war. They never called him Jehovah Rapha because they never got sick. They never called him Jehovah Shalom because they were always at peace. God's character is shown in dimensions. Sometimes you find yourself in situations that are really, really tough. Sometimes you find yourself in situations that are confusing based on what you know in your finite and our finite understanding about God. Sometimes things don't make sense when you have believed it for a long time. Sometimes you are confused about why it's so hard for you to understand who the Lord is. And sometimes it's really difficult because God seems like he's always hiding. And I'm here to tell you that he's not hiding, but he's teaching. Consider what Jesus said concerning what pleased the Father. Matthew eleven twenty-five 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed, it, uh, revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And whom anyone to whom the Son wills, to reveal him. Mm, that's interesting. Nobody knows the Father unless the Son reveals him. Listen to what Jesus says next. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and what? Learn. Oh, learn from me. Wow. How many of you know, how many of you knew that you had to learn from Jesus? It's a learning thing. We don't get it instantaneously. This is not osmosis. We have to learn from him. How many of y'all know that a yoke is something? We know about the yoke. We talked about it several times. We all know what it is. But it's something to do with a yoke bringing rest. The yoke brings rest. And Jesus reveals the Father through being yoked as you rest. Think about that. He's saying, take upon you my yoke. This is mine. My yoke. It's not somebody else's yoke. It's my yoke. And learn from me. You know, the yoke is between two animals, a beast of burden. And one is, one is the older and one is the younger. And if the younger get out in front, then he's learning the pace because the old one knows the pace. And the younger one gets pulled back and learns how to walk it out and conserve and, and learn how to take on the burden. It, 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 his zeal gets developed, and, and a lot of that sometimes is through pain because these are big animals, and the yoke has to be in a position to be able to pull back and cause some discomfort when you don't walk in the rhythm. So Jesus says, take upon you my yoke and learn from me. What kind of yoke is it? He said, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Wait a minute. So you're trying to tell me as I learn 
to be patient, as I learn to be long-suffering, and as I learn to endure, you mean that's going to bring me rest? And in bringing me rest, I get to have the Father revealed to me? Because remember what Jesus said, no one knows the Father unless I reveal him. So how am I going to reveal the Father? I'm going to reveal him as you get yoked and you start learning from me, and I'm going to reveal the Father to you. I'm going to show you what the Father's like because I've been given authority to do it, and it pleases the Father for you, the ones who are humble enough to let me yoke you to know who the Father is. Oh, man, it all comes together. It's not about the prideful, the arrogant, or everybody that think they know everything. It's about the ones who are willing to get in the yoke. And then he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But it is a yoke and it is a burden. Like I said before the last time I preached, there ain't but two kingdoms. You're going to serve one or the other. It's not, it's, you don't have no third or fourth or fifth one. It ain't but one. It's two. It's either the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. And if you belong to God, you're in the kingdom of light. But in the kingdom of light, that means you get to see. Because in the darkness, you can't see. But in the light, you can. Thy word is a light unto my feet. It's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Yeah. But, but how many of y'all know that in the dark, you got to walk carefully? Because somebody might, like me might sneak up on you. The rest of y'all will get that later. <laughs> now, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And through that yoke, you start to rest. And in the resting stage, you see the Father. Mm. Remember, we're talking about how can we know him? If, he, if he's in a dimension that is not based on eye, ear, and mind. The Father is pleased to reveal it to those who are willing to take on the yoke of learning through life so that they may no longer, with, uh, with, so they may with all the saints, past, present, and future, know what the Father's love is like. To know the depths of it through all the junk accidents, persecutions, and rejections that life can throw at us. Because each time that happens, he opens a corridor to his infinite love that we didn't know. How do people know that you have on a real diamond? Not a cubic zirconia. Well, the way they know is how the light interacts with that ring. It shows the facets as light shines on it. How can you know God? How can we see him as he is? Because something happens through the corridor of pain, of suffering, of rejection that causes a facet of the Father to be seen in a way we've never seen it before. The Lord told me this. He says, when Jesus Christ came into the earth, he died and shed his blood and paid the price because what Adam knew was lost when he fell. But when the second Adam came, the Lord was able to bring that ability back into the earth realm. And he said that now the tables have been turned. What do you mean, Lord? He says, I don't have to fix the world. Now I use the world. That's awesome. Um, That is really awesome if you understand that. If you can pick that up, you really understand it. If 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 you can pick that up and say, how does he use the world? Oh. Listen to this. How can the scripture say nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? 
Because anything that comes at us reveals more about his love for us and it deepens our roots in him. Nothing can separate me from the love of... Uh, wait a minute. What do you mean nothing can separate me? Well, whatever comes at you causes you to go deeper in him because it reveals more of his love. Because as the trouble comes, grace abounds even more. Grace, look, grace don't mean nothing to you until it's activated. It don't mean anything to you. Nobody learns who God is in their uh, prosperity. We have a tendency to rest. We have a tendency to rest on our loyals. We have a tendency to depend on our resources and our wealth. And we don't pray. We don't seek God like we used to. But let me tell y'all something. When something hits your life, you get closer to God real fast. All of a sudden... Your spirit start to say, hey, man, we need to get in God's presence again. And then guess what happens? A corridor opens. And God says, here I am. No way. That's the Lord? Yeah, here I am. In the middle of that. How can we say no weapon formed against me shall prosper? Because as we are ambushed by the evil one, our cry to him causes him to reveal the shield of faith in our spirit that blocks the fiery darts of the enemy as his love reveals to us that we are more than a conqueror. Says he, I'm going to tell y'all something, man. The devil didn't start that fight with Job. Go back and read the scripture. Who started that? The father started that. He started it. Poor Job minding his own business. He over there trying to be godly. God's up there in heaven, him and the enemy, he messing with the enemy. Hey, 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 what about Job, dude? When he asked the, enemy, when he asked the devil, what you been doing? I've been going to and fro on the earth. In other words, I've been going through and causing havoc. I've been going through the earth and doing what I do. I've been going through the earth and causing people to stumble and suffer. And God says, what about Job? What about him? See, God wanted to take Job somewhere. He wanted to take him to a deeper understanding of who he was because Job had a surface understanding. And God says, I think I want to take Job somewhere. Let me instigate this so the accuser can come after him. Why would God want to do that? Man, Lord, leave me alone. I'm going to let Lord, leave me alone. Leave me be, Lord. I, I ain't dying. I, oh, I'm okay, Lord. Okay. I'm not ready to see that about you right now. And the Lord said, but I am. I'm ready to take you deeper. You want to go deeper? Wasn't that you singing, more, Lord? Wasn't that you in church saying that? Wasn't that you saying, more, just show me your heart, oh, Lord? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to. Trying to answer your prayer. Remember? You're the one that was singing that song. Right? Right? We're the one that sings the songs, Right? We the one that pray, Lord, I want to know you more, right? Am I the only one singing them songs? We the ones that sing those songs. We the ones that want that. We ask the question, Lord, can I know you more? Lord, I want to walk with you. I want to be more intimate with you. He said, okay, let's go. Have you considered my servant Job? Well, does he praise you for nothing? Of course he doesn't. But you can go mess with him if you want to, because when you do, I'm going to open a corridor to him. Did you, you, guys, you guys know what the book of Job is really about, right? You won't know what it's about till the end. This is what it's about. When Job, at the beginning of Job, we see Job doing something pretty interesting. And he did it for his children. Because, see, he, he was offering and making prayers to God for his children. Because they like to party. Job had party kids. They used to get together and have parties. And Job would offer offerings and prayers for them in case they did something wrong. <laughs> he would do that. Anybody remember reading that? Job was a righteous man. He said, but, my, but I got a feeling his kids weren't. And so he was like, you know, let me, let me do an offering for them in case they did something they wasn't supposed to be doing so I could cover them. 
At the end of the book of Job, because Job's three friends were talking junk and didn't represent God like they should have, God told those, his three friends, say, hey, you know, you haven't spoken right on me. I want you to get an offering. Take it to Job. And if Job forgive you, then you're forgiven. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. From the time the devil started to the end of Job, was God trying to make Job a priest? Was God showing Job something that would qualify him to minister to God and to man? Because at the end, he said, if Job forgives you, I will forgive you. Wait a minute. Something's crazy about that. God was turning Job into a priest. Just so you guys know, Job is the second oldest book in the Bible. It's Genesis and then Job. So you're reading something before Abraham. So Job was given the right to minister to God and to man because of what God revealed to him through his suffering. Uh-oh, look at your neighbor and say, uh-oh. Oh, what does the scripture say? For you are chosen people. Chosen generation. What are you? Priest of God? That's what it said? Mm-mm. How can you be a priest to something you don't know? How can you minister to God and man and you don't know the one that and how he wants you to minister to man? How can he trust you with ministering to him and man? He got to show you. He got to show us. Interesting, huh? How can he say Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, yes, shall he live. Because the love of God did not let his son suffer decay. Because he resurrected through that love, we know we will also be resurrected and introduced to resurrection power. So guess what? So we do not fear death because of his love. (laughs) We don't fear death. Look, I would say if you fear death, then you haven't walked down a corridor with the Lord. He hasn't revealed to you that you don't have to be afraid of death. See, if you're afraid of death, then you think your life ends when you stop breathing here. You don't know or have experienced the resurrection power of the Father. I remember, I don't know how many of y'all remember when Danny, when his uh, liver was, uh, should have had onions on it because it was no good. When Danny was so sick, man, I'm going to tell you something. Danny's dark, but Danny during that time was darker than me. His ammonia levels were so high that he would be confused and be totally in, knocking on people's doors and all that kind of crazy stuff. Walking around, falling out. I mean, it was just all, it was just like that. And Danny was on the, the, the liver transplant list. Danny, what was the lowest number? What was your lowest number? Where were you at on the list before you became number one? Something like that on the, on the list. And he was dying, and we'd, I, we'd watch him come to church dying. He was dying in the house of the Lord, praising God with everything he got. He was watching him die. Then something happened to Danny that was, most of us would be crying over, but he was rejoicing. What did they find in your liver, Danny? Hold up. Not only does he have a liver that's failing, 
Not only does he have a liver that's failing, but now he got cancer. You know what Danny was doing? He was rejoicing. Tell him why you was rejoicing, Danny. <laughs> oh my God. Hold up, Lord. Wait a minute. Oh, my liver fell and now I got cancer? Don't worry, son. I'm opening up a corridor. I'm opening up a way you can see me that you've never seen me before. When I was in the hospital with leukemia, and the first, that day that I, that, that the most, the craziest day of pain I ever had in my life, you know what God said to me? He, it almost like he didn't care nothing about my pain. But how many of y'all know that's not true? God cares about your pain. He just got a greater place he want to take you. I mean, I was in pain, man. I mean, it was like crazy pain. Like when, when you know, I mean, when you hurt so, when you hurt so bad, you almost stop breathing. And it, was anybody ever like that before? You feel like you're going to stop breathing because you was hurting so bad. You know what the Lord said to me? I said, Lord, where are you? He said, I'm right here. He said, I'm right here. I said, well, Lord, why? I come, I come, I'm in so much pain if you're right here. He said, because you won't come to me. I said, but we talking. We talking. Then he opened up a corridor, and this is what he said to me. He said, when you honor me more than your pain, you will feel my presence. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I had to make a decision. Am I worshiping my pain or am I worshiping him? So I got out the bed, and I, my, I had a long cord on my pick. I got down on the floor. I put a blanket over my head, and I started worshiping the Lord right there in the hospital room. Guess what happened? The pain did not go away. But you know what happened? His presence overcame the pain. I found out I didn't need relief from the pain. I needed his presence. All of a sudden, the pain didn't matter. I, you, see, you may not understand this unless you're in that situation. But the pain did not matter to me, even though I was feeling it. Because his presence was there. Son, I don't have to remove the pain. The pain gets you to my presence. I don't have to remove it. It can stay right where it's at. But what you need to understand is that my presence is greater than anything you feel. When that happens, all of a sudden, feel ain't real. What's real is his, how he approaches me. He opened a corridor and said, son, I'm going to show you that I'm greater than the pain. Because even though I had the pain, guess what other P I had? Peace. I had the peace. And the peace overcame the pain. So the pain didn't have to go nowhere because I was at rest. I wasn't looking for the pain to go away. I was looking to be at rest. But I didn't even know that. So the Lord allowed the pain to stay so he could take me to rest. He allowed the pain to stay so he could get me to rest because I was open and ready to see down the corridor of, whom, of the love of God for me. Yeah. These are but a few of the revelations of the death, the height, the width, and the length of God's love for us. We must be willing to go through the dimensions of learning through suffering and the storms of life. Listen to what Peter said. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which come upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing 
so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exhortation. <laughs> if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And Paul says in Philippians 3, 8 through 11, more than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For who I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his what? Sufferings. Being conformed to his death in order that I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead. <laughs> Man, these are statements that could only be known and spoken as the dimensions of learning are embraced and expected. Are you expecting the Lord to reveal his glory in your trials, persecutions, and your pain? Are you wanting to know him in the fellowship of his suffering? For if you do, a new level of intimacy and freedom from the world will open to you and you will have a better understanding of eternal life. What is eternal life? John chapter 17 verse 3 says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you and your one true God and the Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent. <laughs> the Christian life is a narrow road that is full of pain and full of glory. Man, if you get saved and you're a Christian, you better make up your mind, man. Am I going to let the Lord reveal through life who he is? Or am I going to demand that God keep life from me? He didn't keep it from his son. He ain't going to keep it from us. But he promises through everything that comes your way, I am going to open up a corridor to know my love for you. I'm going to open up a corridor. Mayel and Joando, when I was writing this message, I was thinking about y'all. I was thinking about y'all. So y'all, for those of you who don't know their story, they had a, a baby that's in heaven right now. And it was a very hard thing for them to go through. It was really tough. And they had to, they had, they, they, that it was pain and disbelief. that only a husband and a wife who've been through that can know. But the Lord opened a the corridor then in your hand. Not in doing that season, you gave your life to the Lord, didn't you? And God started the healing process. And then he gave you another one. <laughs> He gave you another one and another one. <laughs> <laughs> and if you would sit down and talk with them, they would tell you what God showed them during that time frame. And what he showed them during that time frame is priceless. Can never, can, can never be returned. Somebody asked me, because one day, Sharon 
will not be my wife. And the only way that's going to happen is she's going to die. Or I'm going to die. Or there ain't nothing else happening. If Sharon walked in the house and said, I'm going to leave you, I'm going to ask her, can I go? <laughs> been with that woman 37 years. I don't even, look, I don't even know. Sharon been doing the, our finance for 37 years. If she died right now, I'm lost. I don't know what nothing at. I don't even know how much in the account. I don't know anything. Sharon, I step up and say, Mom, can I have some money? <laughs> I don't even know. Why break it? It's been working for 37 years. I ain't messing with it. I just step up in line and put my hand out. If something get in there, I do. If something done, I just go about my business, you know. <laughs> but here's the thing. I have to ask myself this question. I know that if God was to separate us like that, I know it would be such an enormous pain to me that I, right now, I can't even think about what it would be like because she's with me. But if she wasn't, I'm thinking about the pain I would feel. And this is the question that I believe the Lord asked of me when I was thinking about that. He asked me, would you rather not, would, would you rather not feel the pain? And I know what that meant. That meant I would not have to know her. You get what I'm saying? For me not to feel that level of pain, I would not have to know her. Uh-uh. No, give me the pain. I'll take the pain. Give me the pain. I, I will endure the pain. Because without the pain, I would not know. We as believers have to say, Lord, give me the pain so I can know you. Open it, let, give me the pain. I'll accept the pain so I can know you. I'll accept the trials and the tribulations so I can see you. I'll accept the rejection and all the stuff I have to do as a Christian, as a believer. I'll take it all because I can see you. What would make Moses say, God told Moses, I send my angel with you. You're going to accomplish the same thing. Moses said, no, man. If your presence don't go with us, we don't want to go. If I need to go through something to see God through the glass dimly, then I'm willing to go through it. We in the body of Christ need to understand all things work together. Good, the bad, and the ugly. Ooh, wah, wah, wah. Y'all older people know what I'm talking about. Y'all young people are like, why you do that? <laughs> Nick at night, go check it out. <laughs> I'm willing to go through the good and the bad and the ugly because I'm looking for the glory, the grace, and the love. You can't get it without that. You are not going to have a relationship with God unless he opens a corridor to you. Remember what he said? Whoever the sons reveal the father to. I'm going to yoke you and teach you, and I'm going to reveal the father to you. I'm going to teach you through dimensions of learning. I'm going to bring you into dimensions sometimes. I'm going to lead you into places that is going to cause you to cry out and then it'll be open to you and you will see it. And then when you see it, you will own it. Amen. You will own it. And nobody would ever be able to take it from you. No situation can ever be able to steal it from you. Nobody would ever be able to change your mind. You know why? Because the corridor, when it's open, it stays open. It's an open door that can never be shut by anybody. So the Lord want to make sure that as your intimacy grows, you are rooted deeper and deeper in him. So nobody will ever be able to steal. What do you say? Store up for yourself in heaven, treasures in heaven. Well, what? Rust, moth, rust, don't get it. 
The Lord is interested in us understanding that he's going to take us through these dimensions. Death, loss, rejection, persecution. Confusion. We'll be in those places. You better believe it. Didn't Jesus talk about two foundations? One is sand and one is rock. He said, a man that built his house on the sand, everything was cool with him until the what? The storm came. And when the storm came, he blew his house down because his foundation was on sand. But that man who built his house on the rock, that he anchored himself in something that was not movable. And the storm came to the guy that was on the sand and on the rock. <laughs> that means we're going to catch it too. Don't think you're not. But since you're anchored in love and in Christ, a corridor of understanding and love will open up to you that the guy on the sand will never know. Because that's God's plan for me and you. That we be yoked and learn and learn him so that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Stand to your feet today. Next week, Pastor Albert will be bringing his series to you guys on waiting. I heard part one this morning. It was amazing. Actually, uh, uh, he didn't even know. He, he knew last night what I was going to preach on, and we was talking about it. And it was like, wow, uh, we always do that because we all, both of us depend on the Lord to tell us what to say. Look, we live in a world right now where people are seeking peace because pleasure's not working anymore. Not in the West. Pleasure's not working. See, we, we, we've always wanted our pleasure. And we, we've never wanted to go through anything. And in the West, we were protected from a lot of things. But there is something that God is allowing to happen right now. Do you know, do you know even in Goshen, how many of y'all know what, what I mean when I say Goshen? Goshen were where the children of God lived in Egypt. And when God instructed Moses to tell them, hey, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to share this supper together from house to house and I want you to take the blood and put it on your doorpost and when the deaf angel come he will pass over you how many of you guys know we don't have it recorded but this is just for me the little black man that there were some disobedient Israelites that night and they didn't put blood on their doorposts because they thought it was nasty and yucky and what, what are we doing? And how many of y'all know their firstborn died that night? Because the deaf angel don't care. The deaf angel is looking for blood that he may pass over. Do you understand right now the Lord is revealing because the blood is applied to us. What the world don't know, he is allowing us to see. He's allowing us to understand. My children, life happens to you and it happens to them. But when life happens to you, it gives me a chance to reveal myself to you. You get to see me when life happens to you. Because I don't have to remove life, I use life. 
Life is no longer your problem. Because you are a son and daughter and the Spirit of God lives inside of you. And so life now is a way for me to open up a corridor so you can see me. Because my ways are not your ways and my ways are higher than your ways. And for you to see and know my ways, I have to draw you to myself. And I use life to bring you close. When you cry, Abba Father, you get to know I'm your father. When you see me as a deliverer, I am pulling you out of the muck and the mire. When you see me as provider, you are down to your last meal that you're gonna eat and die like the widow in Zerapath. But no, I give you more oil and more flour that will last throughout the famine because I'm revealing to you who I am because I love you. <sighs> Father, in the name of Jesus, give you all the praise. <laughs> Father, forgive us for complaining instead of anticipating seeing you. Help us to understand that when things come to us, Lord, it's an opportunity for us to see you high and lift it up. Give us the, the zeal to know that if you allowed something to come in, it is so that it came because you are wanting me to see something about who you are. Since we are rooted in your love, Lord, everything that comes from you is an expression. Your character Everything we see about you expresses your love about who you are, the sovereign Lord. In this place, we praise you, Lord. And we say, it is well with my soul. Come what may, it's well with my soul. Because I will see you in a way I have never seen you before. Blessed be your name, Father, maker of heaven and earth, who brings forth bread from the earth. You are the mighty God, and there's nobody like you and never will be. And you have called us co-heirs with your son Jesus, that we may know him in the fellowship of his suffering and the resurrection from the dead. We give you all the praise, Lord. Continue to show yourself to us as we continue to be triumphant in life through your love that you have deeply rooted us in. So together with all the saints, we may know the height, the width, the length, and the depth of your love for us that's in Christ Jesus. Reveal yourself in every dimension that you have chosen for us to see until we see you face to face and we will be fully known as we know you. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.